Ready? Um, welcome to the fifth plenary session entitled Enhancing Consciousness with Brain Stimulation. My name is... Wait, what is that? <laughs> uh, my name is Justin Riddle, a postdoc. Alrighty. Um, welcome to the fifth plenary session. Oh, wait, hold session. on. I'm here in time. I'm self echo. All right. Apologies for that. Apologies for that. Um, all right. I'm going to start over. Welcome to the fifth plenary session entitled Enhancing Consciousness with Brain Stimulation. My name is Justin Riddle, a postdoc at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the scientific director of the Carolina Center for Neurostimulation. Um, as a neuroscience researcher committed to the development of novel brain st uh, stimulation interventions for psychiatric illness, I'm excited to be chairing this session on brain stimulation, and it's an honor to introduce our speakers today. So the structure of this plenary will be two talks with duration of 25 minutes each. After both of these talks, there will be 20 to 25 minutes for questions and answers. So please submit your questions to the Q&A and I will read them to our speakers at the end after both of the talks are completed. All right, so first up is Dr. Alexander Bistritsky, who recently retired from UCLA to pursue the development of new brain stimulation tools. He is currently Professor Emeritus and Director Emeritus of the University of California, Los Angeles's um, anxiety Disorders Program and Targeted Brain Stimulation in the Jane and Terry Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. His current positions outside of UCLA include co-founder and executive director of Tiny Blue Dot Foundation, president of the Institute of Advanced Consciousness Studies in Santa Monica, California, and he is also the founder and CEO of Brain Sonics Corporation and CSO of Synaptech Research Corporation. Dr. Bistrisky spent much of his career investigating anxiety disorders to develop better treatments and understanding of the illness. In addition, Dr. Bistritsky is a pioneer in research using focused transcranial ultrasound stimulation to target specific brain regions. Dr. Pist Dr. Bistritsky is passionate that the future of psychiatric intervention will continue to integrate advanced neurostimulation techniques with standard care. Let's welcome Dr. Alexander Bistritsky to the virtual stage. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let me go to my slide set. Thank you for this introduction. Okay, so uh, I'll be talking about this uh, wonderful new tool, low intensity focus ultrasound pulse. And I was properly introduced. This is my conflict of interest and, uh, and positions. So uh, I truly believe that uh, we're going to move in psychiatry and maybe in other ne neurosciences to looking into the brain for the answers and uh, starting to see how the brain works and uh, discovering how it makes the consciousness or how it connects with the consciousness is one of the things that we're going to be studying. Um, one of the great tools that we had within the last 30 years was deep brain stimulation. It's basically a pacemaker uh, that was uh, placed to different areas. Um, excuse me, uh, Dr. Bistrisky, uh, could you share your screen? Uh, we're not able to see your slides currently. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, let me exit uh, that. I, I thought that I placed the sharing the screen. Okay. Um, There's a green share screen button at the center of the Zoom call. All right. Let me start again. Um, so the problem is when it there, it doesn't let me. Uh, okay, let me see if I all right, I'll, I'll, now can you see it? Looks great, yep, looks good. All right, so this is how we, I think, going to be studying brain in psychiatry in the future, moving from cognitive or analyzing emotions and presentation to actually looking into the brain and seeing what's happening. And uh, one of the tools uh, that helps you to do that is using the electrodes uh, in the brain. But 
we uh, can use life up which is low intensity low frequency uh, ultrasound pulse about the same way as we could use dbs and i will explain to that so it has multiple research diagnostic therapeutic uses uh, there are many uh, names right now in scientific literature. We choose life up because we're working with coma patients and waking some of them up. So we decided to use this. Uh, but there is TFAS, uh, life foo, and uh, FAS that you may find in different areas. So how that works? Uh, we have a, a transducer who is attached to the head then we could position people into MRI unit. We could see the target. If we uh, feel like we're a little bit off target, we could, uh, we could actually uh, correct ourselves by moving uh, the device. Uh, transducer emits low intensity pulses and uh, it's ultra, uh, activity of the brain and then we could observe that on function of MRI. So that's uh, in general. Uh, actually, um, we have long history of brain stimulation. Uh, it started uh, 2000 years ago when uh, the physician uh, of Emperor Claudius used torpedo electrical fish to treat migraines. And uh, it, it took a couple of thousand years because we started to get approval for RTMS device, um, repeated transcranial magnetic stimulation of the brain or, or others. So it takes a long time to develop. Uh, similarly for sound, sound has been used uh, in the wars historically, drums and others. There is also current use of sonic and ultrasonic devices for uh, kind of human control. Uh, but focus ultrasound used for neuroscience started with Harvey. This is the, basically I'm going just to cite the review that we wrote in 2011. It was published in Brain Stimulation. I'm the first author. Basically Harvey did the first application to neuronal tissue then Fry and uh, uh, his group uh, had renewed interest to somewhat 30 years later because I think physiological uh, assessment of the brain improved. Then uh, it was replicated in Russia, in France, in Canada. And then it was a lull until about 90s when uh, uh, we started to get functional assessments of the brain. And then uh, Yoles in Brigham and Women Hospital did high full, high intensity focus ultrasound on the brain, mostly for surgery, first experiment. And that resulted in uh, Insight Tech uh, company that is device company and right now uses uh, the device for brain surgeries. We applied for the first patent because uh, uh, at that time I was thinking we could marry focus ultrasound and administer that as a pulse together with uh, function of MRI and study brain in this way. And uh, this patent was, uh, 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 several patents actually were published, uh, in, uh, patent uh, ap applications applied in 2002 and 2003. McDonald um, in uh, uh, Women and Brigham Hospital actually started to open blood brain barrier. And then Alexander used, uh, and uh, Balukani uh, used uh, high food to open thrombolysis. In uh, 2006, we already started some. Uh, MRI guided experiment that I will uh, uh, show you later on bullfrogs and rabbits. Um, and then Tyler had the first publication of applying uh, life food for neuromodulation of brain slices and life mice. I uh, actually reviewed all of that in 2011 and I said, 
we need in this review we need to go to human brain it sounds like it's a safe area to use and sure enough uh, Dr. Hamarov who is known to everybody used in 2012 um, a just general Doppler ultrasound and then um, Dr. Stern at UCLA used life up in epileptic patients uh, prior to their surgery under ID, it was safety study. Uh, soon after that, uh, you and Kim uh, uh, applied life up to sensor motoric uh, area. Legon and Tyler had uh, this uh, application on again sensor motor cortex. And, uh, and the whole area then began. Monty started to use that in UCLA for Alzheimer's disease, normal controls. Uh, what I wanted to say that in, uh, there have been several very good publications, 2018, uh, 2020 just uh, started and COVID of course uh, interfered with the research, but there are several interesting publications. Uh, for example, um, uh, our study uh, of safety of ultrasound and also uh, a pain study that was done by Bashar Bardan in uh, its double blind control, pain control uh, study uh, uh, by suppressing thalamic area. So uh, overall focus ultrasound foundation shows that there are a lot of publications and a lot of ci uh, citations and they exponentially increasing. This area becomes an area of very fruitful research. Uh, also me media starting to catch up and uh, um, uh, write about that. Uh, we had several pod podcasts about our device and we uh, and we actually were written up in Science uh, Magazine. And, um, and NIMH and NIH starting to give grants in this field, and they also exponentially increase. How does it work? Uh, main, uh, uh, again, nobody knows, but nobody knows even how uh, RTMS works. Possibly it uh, increases uh, permeability in, of cell membrane. We basically focus ultrasound pulse, it's acoustic waves just hit the cell, distend the membrane, so permeability increases uh, uh, potassium, sodium mechanism of depolarization start getting active. Uh, mechanical energy by activating mechanoreceptors is another mechanism we just submitted a uh, review uh, to um, Nature and hopefully it will be published soon and then we're listing many mechanisms like change in um, membrane um, state, uh, thermodynamic waves, uh, direct uh, flexoelectricity, uh, thermal modulation, cavitation modulation, and micro bubble uh, resonance that Stuart probably going to talk about later on so in some of his talk. So the key advantages of this technology is that it's non-invasive, has relatively small focus, it's about 1.5 centimeter over uh, half a centimeter. It uh, it reaches deep target, targets, we could reach the mem uh, midline. Uh, even with the single transducer uh, system, we could hit areas as thalamic area, uh, head of nucleus caudatus. We could do brain mapping because we could co-administer that with uh, MRI, it's actually uh, in real time. And you could flexibly change the targets and stimulate several areas in one session, which hopefully will be next stage of the research. So just wanted to show you a couple of uh, fundamental papers that led us to believe that it uh, works. First of all, we found that it was safe. This is in rabbit's brain and uh, basically uh, uh, focus ultrasound. Uh, if you for example, here, activate, uh, this is a function of MRI uh, on rabbit cortex. 
you activate the cortex by shining lights into rabbit's eyes and then cortex become inactive with only few seconds seven seconds or nine seconds of stimulation for almost 11 minutes so that is a very strong suppressive a component that we found in that first experiment and then it was applied to uh, epilepsy models both chronic and acute and acute has been published in 30 rats with repetitive treatments we could suppress uh, seizures and uh, that's you uh, at all publications uh, in 30 rats we as you could see here we could suppress uh, uh, seizures uh, over the period of time almost as good as Valium. We have spectacular actual videos that show that. This is the device uh, and basically this is the hockey pack that goes into MRI. Device stays uh, outside of the MRI chamber and you could regulate intensity, frequency and uh, do some other thing. We received several uh, IDs for this. Uh, uh, basically, many universities, when they purchase it, they apply for ID, and we have master files that help them to do that. This is human study results that some human epileptics, and you could see uh, here the activation area. It's like a small spider and temporal lobe, and then uh, responding cingulum and cortical areas. So this is uh, brain mapping. Um, uh, this is uh, what happening when you apply it to coma patient. You see life up on and function of MRI increases, off, decreases, on, off, on, off. This is how it looks like. Uh, by now, Dr. Monty, who may be presenting in this conference, I don't know, will uh, present the results of 23 patients and 13 acute and 10 uh, chronic uh, some of them five years who either improved or emerged from coma so uh, this uh, this actually received IDE and we're proceeding with pivotal study for treatment of coma patients currently this is uh, those responses where we administered uh, 10 times higher doses uh, uh, than in previous experiments and actually it was still safe and as you could see networks activation is dose dependent. Uh, this is the recent study on hippocampus, amygdala and uh, entorhinal cortex conducted by Taylor Kuhn and uh, Susan Buchheimer at UCLA and uh, uh, we could see that they um, uh, getting very strong suppressions of the target areas. Um, now, um, so what's the potential us uses of life up at brain mapping, treating many psychiatric and neurological conditions, including coma, Alzheimer's, maybe Parkinson's, pain, anxiety, anxiety is my dream, actually, and there are first experiments started on suppression of amygdala with very, very good uh, results. Um, but it's open study, so we don't know, but it's on very, very treatment resistant patients. So uh, uh, studying the brain, uh, see how that operates, how that's going to be a great tool for that. And we're uh, trying to develop right now specific setup and uh, Institute for Advanced Consciousness Studies. Uh, opening blood brain barrier uh, and delivering medications, uh, stem cells, nanotechnology like um, uh, RAG Iron does in, uh, in Stanford. And we also trying to deliver right now uh, and demonstrated that in some studies delivering exosomes to the brain and we we're trying to develop technology that would uh, maybe stuff exosomes with some uh, uh, active su substances, microdoses like psilocybin or DMT, and delivering to specific targets within the brain. That could be another tool for uh, for studying brain. So there are uh, many ongoing human trials. This is ongoing studies. Uh, 
like generalized anxiety in the UCLA and soon starts in Mount Sinai. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, UCLA just got a very large grant to study Parkinsonian and Alzheimer's disease and uh, we conducted some trial also in uh, Neurological Institute of Los Angeles. Uh, coma, uh, we're preparing for, we received break, break, uh, FDA breakthrough awards uh, uh, and right now uh, uh, we're moving toward pivotal studies on that. Thalamic stimulation in normal subjects, it's about uh, to be published. Uh, uh, by the way, generalized anxiety study is submitted to science and it's under review. Seizure disorders, uh, UCLA and MGH is going to do uh, several studies. Actually, we're applying for IRB right now and waiting for approval. TBI, uh, Brown VA and Stanford uh, VA uh, have PTSD and, uh, and uh, TBI applications. They have the devices right now. They receive the devices already and preparing, uh, waiting to open uh, their facilities for experimental uh, pain. Uh, maybe addiction and uh, Medical University of Southern Carolina. Um, uh, uh, Baylor and MGH uh, both have the device and receive OCD Foundation Breakthrough Award. And we'll be uh, starting OCD experiments and now in, uh, in uh, Santa Monica we'll be starting some other uh, experiments uh, on OCD in open way and uh, brain uh, uh, mapping, uh, Greg uh, Franza, uh, Franza from uh, Dell University just received Rising Star Award and we'll be doing brain mapping uh, using our device. So basically what I wanted to say for life up technology is probably will help us in this way enter the brain, find out what's going on, apply some standardized tests and actually start to repair way uh, in many ways, just application of slowing down some circuits or delivering uh, uh, micro doses of medications uh, to specific location. So I, I, I would like to finish on, on this note. I, I'm very excited about future uh, next uh, 10 years really will be exciting in brain research, uh, consciousness research, and, uh, and uh, uh, actually psychiatry and neurology. All right. Wow. Well done. Um, very impressive. You're able to bring people out of comas. Totally, uh, potentially very transformative. Um, yeah, if you could uh, close the sharing of your screen, Dr. Bistrisky. I'm Thank trying you. to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I'm going to mute myself for now. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so to the uh, listeners out there, uh, I am receiving your questions for the Q&A session. We'll do the Q&A at the end after um, Dr. Jay Sanguinetti has given his talk. So keep the questions coming in um, and we'll have time at the end for that. So, all right, so next up is Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, who received his PhD from the University of Arizona, studying visual perception with electrophysiology. Since then, Dr. Sanguinetti's interests have evolved towards a better understanding of the neural basis of mindfulness. He has devoted his work to building mindfulness interventions and tools such as neurostimulation that can improve the accessibility and accelerate the efficacy of mindfulness techniques. His work is visionary at the cutting edge between advanced neuroscientific methodology and contemplative practices of mindfulness. Dr. Sanguinetti is now a research assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona, and associate director of the Center of Consciousness Studies. The work that he is presenting is in collaboration with Dr. Shinzen Young, who will be available for the Q&A. Um, I will introduce uh, Dr. Shinzen Young at that time. So uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jay Sanguinetti to the virtual stage. All right, thank you so much, Justin. Um, I just wanted to start out by sending a big thank you to Abby Stewart and the production crew for TSC, uh, Commotion Studios. This has been a massive undertaking to get this online so we can all interact here in this space. So I'm feeling a lot of gratitude for them. Um, I've seen all the work that they've done and been great to see all of my friends and all the new people online. I'm seeing your 
little chats pop up is giving me lots of joy. So good to see everybody. Okay, let me let me get my screen going. So um, I'm really pleased today to talk about the research that Shenzhen Young and I have been collaborating on. Oh, for the better part of two to three years now, uh, Shenzhen and I have launched a lab at the University of Arizona called Similab. And as Justin said, Shenzhen will be on the line um, after this. So if you have any questions specific for him um, or a question specific for how ultrasound is modulating um, mindfulness, uh, save those for Shenzhen. So uh, the lab is called Similab. That stands for Sonication Enhanced Mindfulness Acquisition. I know that's a mouthful, but what I'll do in this talk uh, briefly is unpack what we mean by each of these terms and our vision for trying to use ultrasound neuromodulation, which you just heard about um, from a beautiful talk by Dr. Bostritsky, uh, to try to facilitate the learning of mindfulness. So uh, what do we mean by mindfulness? Well, in a very broad sense, mindfulness can be defined as being present with moment to moment experience without getting caught up in it. And we're starting to learn um, from the new science, uh, contemplative science, that many features of cognition are um, enhanced, uh, by, enhanced or attenuated by learning mindfulness. That's including uh, increasing emotional control and, um, and regulation, all the way to reducing stress and in the long term, increasing well being and happiness broadly defined. Now, Mindfulness is also becoming a useful intervention uh, for many different disorders. The best evidence so far is for chronic pain, uh, but there is some growing evidence for addiction, depression, and anxiety as well. And now, why would this be? Well, when we are trying to define mindfulness in the lab, uh, it's traditionally and famously or infamously been difficult to operationalize mindfulness. And so one of the great things of working with Shenzhen is he's come up with a very fine-grained definition, which focuses on a form of awareness that we're calling mindful awareness, which is that present-centered sort of non-graspy awareness that has three core features. Uh, these are equanimity, clarity, and concentration. And each of these work together. They can be developed through practice and cultivation. And the more that you have each of these, the more we would say you have mindful awareness. So concentration is uh, pretty simple. It's your ability to focus. So if you're focusing on me right now, you have more concentration. Sensory clarity is being able to track perception. So you might think of a baseball player who trains themselves to be able to track a baseball moving at 90 miles an hour. They're increasing their sensory clarity. Equanimity has been the difficult one to define in the lab, uh, but basically it's something like an attitude of openness towards all of your experience. So positive, negative, and neutral, it's that attitude of openness towards that. Um, we like to think of it, Shenzhen likes to talk about it like friction in the system or maybe stickiness in the system. And so this notion of getting caught up would be low equanimity and not getting caught up would be uh, having more of that. Um, just to give you an example, if you get in a fight, uh, say with a loved one, and they say something mean that hurts your feelings, uh, you can tune into that, you can realize that your feelings are being hurt. And if you have equanimity, you would realize that that's happening and let it go versus getting automatically triggered to say something mean back. Uh, in the case of equanimity, you could reapply your concentration to listening to that person because you wanna hear what they have to say. So that would be a case of equanimity. All of these skills combine to leading to those positive benefits that I talked about, but mindfulness is often very difficult. Uh, if you've tried it yourself, it's often frustrating in the beginning. And especially when we think about applying this in the clinic, uh, it's very hard to get depressed people or people with anxiety to actually meditate for eight weeks at a time. And so this prevents many people from experiencing the benefits uh, that we would like to get them to in the clinic. So with that question in Similab, we've been motivated to ask, can we modulate the brain networks that are involved in learning mindfulness? Now, I will admit that the science of contemplative uh, science is still very young. Uh, we are learning quite a bit about how mindfulness impacts the brain and behavior, uh, but the science is frankly quite messy and we have a long way to go to understand this. And so being able to use a tool like uh, ultrasound neuromodulation allows us to modulate the networks to try to understand first how mindfulness is impacting the brain 
Um, so we get at the mechanism, as Dr. Bostritsky was talking about. And once we understand that mechanism, then we can ask whether we can facilitate mindfulness-based interventions to help patients experience those benefits sooner. And we think maybe that would happen through plasticity. It's possible that ultrasound is inducing plasticity. We don't know yet. But if that's the case, then we can help people acquire those mindfulness skills faster. So uh, you just heard a beautiful talk about ultrasound neuromod, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Um, but I first got into this actually because of Dr. Stuart Hameroff, um, who is uh, the leader of, of TSC, as you might say. And uh, Stuart got me interested when I was back in graduate school as a tool, as Dr. Bristritsky said, that could uh, offer the ability to focally modulate brain activity. And so uh, we've been working together, uh, Stuart Hameroff and I and Dr. John Allen for several years. We've just published a paper recently showing that we can use this tool to actually enhance mood. Um, so thinking about enhancing consciousness, we enhance mood um, in about 40 subjects. Um, and so this tool then becomes a very powerful, potentially powerful intervention for modulating network level activity in the brain. So here's one study that um, Dr. Bostritsky already talked about previously, but basically showing that you can focus a beam of acoustic energy into the brain and you can both upregulate and downregulate above and below baseline, um, at least in the MRI. And so as Shinzen and I started really thinking about this and whether we could use this tool to try to understand how mindfulness is impacting the brain and then ultimately use it to facilitate the practice. Um, now back in 2014, I did a very uh, simple study where we targeted the interior cingulate cortex with ultrasound. So you can see the focus beam here is targeting these pieces of cortex. And the basic question was, can we stimulate or excite the brain to induce a state of mindfulness? Uh, we targeted the anterior cingulate because that shows up when you're beginning to learn mindfulness. And I don't have a lot of time to go into detail, but the basic effect was uh, relative to baseline, people who got real stimulation actually reported uh, more non-attachment, which is a downstream effect, we think, of mindful awareness, uh, relative to placebo control, so a different group. Now, these were non-meditators. They were just sitting, doing a resting task um, and not doing anything. But this at least suggested to us that it might be possible to induce something like a mindful state. The problem here is the non-attachment scale doesn't really parse concentration, clarity, and equanimity. And so it wasn't clear quite what we were stimulating. And so Shenzhen and I started whiteboarding as we do uh, many long hours in the lab in Tucson. And we started wondering what systems and subsystems in the brain could we target with ultrasound neuromodulation to try to enhance these skills independently. And uh, Shenzhen's hypothesis was that if we could excite or inhibit some part of the brain to induce a state like equanimity, that might actually help participants learn the other skills or acquire the other skills faster. And so that's the basic paradigm that we're trying to build to in the lab. Once we can do that, then we will increase mindful awareness for our patients. Now, uh, what's really interesting about uh, this paradigm that we're working on is that you might think we want to try to stimulate something in the brain to stimulate the state of mindful awareness. But it turns out that um, there's another way to think about this, which may be to, in, to remove a certain cortical, sorry, remove is sort of a strong, but reduce cortical activation because there are certain brain areas that may be getting in the way of something like equanimity. And so we have termed these non-equanimity hubs, and we're trying to basically temporarily inhibit them uh, with the hypothesis that equanimity would emerge. And so uh, these are the two systems that I'll talk about that we focused on so far. Um, first, we focused on the corticobasal ganglia system. So this is the system that involves dopamine and learning, uh, basically learning stimulus response. And we know uh, based on addiction and other disorders that this system can get biased towards maladaptive behavior. And it can probably bias your perception towards maladaptive behavior as well. Um, Shenzhen was reading uh, in the literature and actually discovered another disorder of the system that's truly fascinating. It's called athymhormia. Um, that's kind of a mouthful as well. But athymhormia occurs only when you get bilateral lesions to both sides of the corticobasal ganglia loop. Uh, it's very rare, but if you can get that, you get these patients who 
as far as I can tell, are some of the most fascinating disorders of consciousness that you can find in the sense that they seem to have no content to their experience unless you activate them from the outside. So let me give you an example. A patient shows up to the office, to the doctor's office, and they basically just sit and stare at the wall for hours or days, uh, not using the bathroom, not doing anything until you ask them what they're doing. And once you ask them, it activates the system and they seem relatively cognitively preserved. So they can do tasks, they can remember, everything seems to be kind of preserved, which is fascinating. But that then leads to a really interesting situation for some patients. So one of the patients in the literature was sitting in the sun for so long, it was like eight hours, that she got severe sunburn. And when they asked her, you know, did you notice that you were getting sunburned? She said, well, now that you ask, yeah, there was pain, immense, immense pain, but I didn't really suffer from it. And therefore, what's the point? Why should I move out of the sun? Okay, so you can sort of see where we're going with this now. Uh, Shenzhen and I started thinking about this and thinking, wow, okay, this is a clear level of dysfunction of equanimity, if you want to think about it like that. But it's pointing us to something very interesting. This system may be a substrate for one form of equanimity. And so we started cooking up an experiment to do. Um, because this is a disorder, we wanted to be very careful. Obviously, we don't want to induce athymormia in people. We want to induce equanimity. And so we actually started with Shenzhen as our first subject. Uh, so this is about two years ago here. And we decided to take a very long-term practitioner because even in regular meditation, if you go on a retreat um, or do some very intense practice, negative psychological experiences can happen. It's not all uh, peaches and roses. And so we knew that if this accelerated people deeply, uh, it might, they might need some help uh, integrating what's happening to them. And so we started with Shenzhen. He's got 40 to 50 years of meditation experience. He's dealt with a lot of these um, abnormal psychological states. Um, and we basically did a four week protocol where we targeted the bilateral corticobasal ganglia loop on Shenzhen. And he gave me self reports. Uh, every once in a while, I would placebo him. So I had real stim and placebo conditions. And in those stimulation conditions, Shenzhen started reporting a very deepening of his equanimity state, which then seemed to interact with his mindfulness meditation practice. So uh, we got very excited by this uh, when I was a postdoc back in New Mexico and started thinking about how can we systematically study this. So, uh, and we also are very aware that Shenzhen and I are, are relatively biased to see this effect. So we have to replicate this in people who aren't so biased. So uh, we tried to get long-term meditators into the lab um, in New Mexico. This was in collaboration with Vince Clark's lab. It turns out to be relatively difficult to find these long-term practitioners. So we can only get five. Um, but we came up with a four-day protocol where they were getting um, about five minutes of ultrasound um, every third or fourth day for four days. And we basically asked them to meditate and report you know, what was happening to them. We used a standardized scale called the Toronto Mindfulness Scale. It's not the best scale of mindfulness, uh, but it has a dimension that's similar to equanimity called decentering, basically just awareness with some distance from your experience. And uh, the basic finding was that after four days of this intervention, these long-term meditators reported an increase, an increase in equanimity. Now, I also had them do a phenomenological self-report. I like people to write what their experience is like. And basically the bigger words here mean that that was more times reported. And basically you can see the word cloud. This was the overall experience across uh, four, four or five subjects. And the basic finding was that it was a good experience, that it did seem to deepen them into their equanimity practice. And a couple of them, four out of the five, actually said something like, this was like being on retreat, meditation retreat, uh, for, for a long time, you know, a week or something like that. So they were, uh, a couple of them were very skeptical that this would do anything, and they were pretty sh um, struck by how powerful this seemed to be. So um, as I've defined equanimity, if you think about it like the friction in the system and trying to reduce the friction, uh, that should happen across multiple systems and subsystems in the brain. We wouldn't expect just the basal ganglia to be a source of equanimity. And so Shenzhen and I started looking at other systems in the brain that we may target to try to induce equanimity. 
And so, uh, as you might expect, we decided on the default mode network as another non-equanimity hub. So this is a system that may be interfering with equanimity. Uh, very basically, the default mode is a heavily studied part of the brain, uh, network in the brain that essentially shows up when you're not doing a task. So uh, I'm doing a study right now at the University of Arizona. I put you in the scanner and I'd say, just sit there for 20 minutes. If you do that, you tend to go into your default state. You start thinking to yourself, the sort of selfing system comes online. You may mind wonder, daydream, and things like that. And you see an increase in activation in this system. Now, um, it's been proposed that the default mode network, the DMN, may actually interfere with mindfulness practice. And what's interesting about it is if you put long-term meditators in the scanner and you look at their default mode activation, you see the opposite pattern to a regular person if they're meditating. So this blue indicates less activation relative to baseline. And these are long-term meditators who are doing different types of practice. And the basic finding across many studies now is that specifically this back part, it's called the posterior cingulate, gets reduced while you're applying a meditation practice. Now it doesn't stay. If the meditator is in the scanner without meditating, default mode goes relatively normal, but it's specifically about meditating. But why would we think that the default mode network has something to do specifically with equanimity? Well, this is one of my favorite studies. Uh, it comes out of Judd Brewer's lab um, when he was at Yale. And basically they have meditators and non-meditators in the MRI scanner. And they actually have a screen where they're seeing their brain activation of the default mode network in real time. So this screen would be right in front of them. And they're basically seeing, does the DMN, this area, activate or deactivate relative to baseline. And they're trying to meditate. So what you can see is this person is sink, sinking in or deepening into their meditation practice throughout about a 30 minute or an hour period. Now, if you ask the meditators to report moment by moment what their experience is like as they're getting this feedback, it seems to be in the direction of equanimity. So effortless doing is sort of like less friction in the system. And that the more that you sort of downregulate that default mode area, the more that correlates with that particular state. And now you might ask what happens when you put non-meditators in and you ask them to meditate. Now you see the basic finding of sort of frustration with the meditation. This is probably what I looked like for the first couple of years when I was trying to meditate. But basically they're trying to apply the same practice that these people are doing but now they're activating their DMN and that correlates with being distracted and uh, basically upset or frustrated. So the opposite of equanimity. They're getting carried away um, in their experience. So uh, with that, we have tried two pilot studies. I'm gonna show you the second one now um, that we have collected at the University of Arizona, where we have tried to inhibit, so use inhibitory ultrasound on the back region of the default mode network with the prediction that we should increase momentary equanimity. We recorded a baseline resting state fMRI pre and post, and we did this on non-meditators. We actually used an inhibitory protocol that comes out of Dr. Bostritsky's work. Uh, we call this the UCLA protocol. And um, we basically had people report what it was like after they came out of the scanner. The basic finding again is that uh, we were able to increase decentering, so increasing a proxy measure of equanimity. And when we talk to the participants about their experience so far, um, about three-fourths of them are spontaneously reporting less thinking. If they are thinking, it's easier, they keep saying. Um, most of them are saying it's easier to be in the scanner. And a lot of them are actually saying that time is going by faster. Uh, so there's some sort of time effect that's occurring. When we look at the network that we are targeting, we see something very interesting. So uh, this is a connectivity plot. Basically, I'm seeding the region that we're inhibiting. So ultrasound is going here. Red means that these are connected. Blue means they're disconnected. And this is the basic default mode activation that you would see. So this is before ultrasound. Now we're giving them inhibitory ultrasound to this region. And you can see uh, visually that it looks like the connectivity is going down. It's not significant, so we can't say anything about that. But when we look 25 minutes out, um, which is interesting because that's the same amount of time it takes for Stuart and I to see our effects on mood. When we look 25 minutes out, we see a significant reduction in connectivity within the piece of the uh, network that we actually targeted with ultrasound. 
Um, it also looks like the connectivity went away between the front and the back, but it's not significant at this point, so um, we can't say much about it. But the connectivity between the posterior cingulate and the precuneus, which is in the default mode network, actually significantly reduces. And we get voxel by voxel reduction, which is quite interesting, actually. That's suggesting that some more noise is being put into the system. Um, but at least this then maps onto the phenomenology of what our subjects were reporting. So that's exciting. This is the first example where we've been able to target such a deep structure in the brain with focused ultrasound and in, in, in the default mode network, at least, uh, to show some in, inhibition of that system that's then mapping on to phenomenology. Now, um, if you're thinking about networks in the brain, you might think, well, what about the front part of the network? Can we also reduce with ultrasound the front uh, hub or node and reduce the connectivity as well? So uh, we tried that in collaboration with uh, Vince Clark and Tim Mullen um, and his company, Entheon. And basically the idea was to try to do ultrasound at the same time as EEG, which was possible, and then look at a measure of connectivity um, for default mode activation in the alpha wave. So if you have an EEG on and you're basically just sitting and doing nothing, uh, default mode activates, alpha activates. So alpha is a marker of default mode. And we predicted a reduction in that alpha. So basically what we found after just five minutes of ultrasound inhibition, a massive reduction in alpha. So this is that 10 Hertz alpha and purple is below baseline. Almost every electrode was significant. We had to go back and check our results because uh, that's uh, almost too big of an effect. And you can see beta and theta were also changing as well. Now, if we look at the seed, if we actually seed the prefrontal and the posterior hubs of this network, we again see a reduction in alpha. So this is 10 hertz, baseline is in blue. And again, we're seeing a reduction in both of those areas um, with source estimated EEG. But really, we wanted to know about phenomenology and does, does the connectivity of the system map the phenomenology? So if we do source estimation and look at alpha connectivity, so this is showing between the back and the front of the default mode network, we get a significant reduction in connectivity. And what's interesting about this is that the subjects reported no change. So uh, even on the meditation mindfulness scales or in the self-report, the change was actually uh, nothing or I'm slightly bored. Um, so this is pretty fascinating that the, la the back of the default mode network gives us this equanimity effect, we think, but the prefrontal part and the connectivity don't. It really suggests that it's not just reducing network connectivity, but it's actually doing something to the posterior cingulate, which may be regulating that network connectivity, for example. So uh, now we want to apply SIMA, obviously. Uh, we're replicating those results, those pilot studies I showed you just now, and now we're replicating with a much bigger study. And really we want to ask, does inhibition of the default mode network during mindfulness training actually lead to equanimity? If that's the case, then the real question is, does enhancing equanimity lead to positive outcomes, uh, both for patients and for the general population? Because really, uh, we're interested in understanding the mechanism of equanimity, but we want this to be a clinical, clinically effective practice. And so it should lead people in the direction of being happier, increasing their well-being, and reducing symptoms if we're treating patients. And so the experiment we're designing now is this two-month protocol. It's a giant study uh, where we're taking neuroimaging, and we're actually looking at behavioral measures of equanimity, concentration, and clarity and trying to ask if we increase one, do we increase the others? And does that all correlate with an increase in well-being? So we're very excited about launching this study. Um, and I just wanna leave you with two slides. I think I have about 30 seconds uh, to show what the hope of the lab is. Uh, so the basic hope is a better understanding of how the brain and behavior are affected by uh, mindfulness training. Once we have that understanding, we want to be able to target networks in the brain to give people the experience um, that we're talking about and the benefits of mindfulness. Once we do that, that informs us about which brain networks we should study, which updates our understanding about how to increase the experience for people. And so we hope that this whole approach then uh, leads to an exponential growth of happiness in our subjects and our patients. Now, uh, this is not in the literature yet, but this is a claim that uh, we might make, which is that as you learn those mindfulness skills, concentration, clarity, and equanimity, 
And as you increase your trait or baseline level of mindful awareness, uh, the effects can compound, they can become exponential, such that well-being and happiness uh, increase exponentially over time. And so the dream and the hope of the lab is to use these tools to basically help individual subjects get on this exponential growth of happiness and then hopefully help humanity at large uh, also get on this. So that's our, our grandiose hope for the lab. And I think that that is likely much needed uh, during our current uh, situation. Thank you very much. All right, that was another amazing talk. Very exciting. Um, please everyone post your questions in the Q&A. Um, so we'll now be entering a 20 minute questions and answers period. Um, I will read the questions to the speakers, uh, post on the interface. Um, and in addition, we'll have Dr. Shinzen Young joining us. So I'll give him a quick inter introduction now. Uh, Dr. Shinzen Young is uh, collaborating with Dr. Jay Sanguinetti on the work that was just presented. Um, he is a American mindfulness teacher and neuroscience research consultant. He received, he received his PhD in Buddhist studies at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Young has authored many successful books, including The Science of Enlightenment and Natural Pain Relief. His systematic approach to categorizing, and adapting, and teaching meditation, known as unified mindfulness, has resulted in collaborations with Harvard Medical School, Carnegie Mellon University, University of Vermont, and then starting this lab with Dr. Jay Sanguinetti. That was just mentioned. Um, and let's welcome him to the stage. All right, so uh, I'll go through some questions. Uh, start off with one for uh, Jay Sanguinetti, and I'm gonna kind of piggyback my own question in on this one. Um, you started off by talking about targeting the head of the caudate, which is sort of part of this uh, frontal parietal action planning task positive uh, network in the brain, often pitted against the default mode network. Um, so how do you kind of square that first experiment that you did with Dr. Young with your uh, targeting of the default mode in those follow-up experiments. And then one of the uh, people in the audience asked, what if you were to target both the basal system and the default mode at the same time? Or essentially, yeah, do you think there's a difference there or what, what really that, how that breaks down? Yeah, that's a great question, Justin. And I've showed that data a few times and no one has asked that. So that's a very intuitive uh, question as well. Um, that really gets at this issue of trying to parse concentration, clarity, and equanimity. And really, you know, obviously these are overlapping skills. So when you increase one, you may increase the other one um, at the same time. But the, the, the anterior cingulate, so the anterior portion of the cingulate is really involved at the beginning of learning mindfulness. So it shows up for beginners, but it tends to go back down to baseline once you integrate the skills. And that's likely because the ACC is part of this error monitoring or error detection system. And it's really helping you monitor where your attention is and when it's gone off task. And so it's likely by exciting or stimulating that system, we were giving people more of that capacity. And then we asked them a bunch of questions about how attached are they, uh, which is not a relatively good measure of that. Um, but they still thought, okay, I'm sort of more in the moment because I'm, allow I'm, I'm sort of, not paying attention to something else and I'm getting better control over that attention. Um, but that's a very good question. Whereas in the other studies that we were showing, we're actually inhibiting the back part of that system uh, to try to get that piece out of the way. So you can think about the prefrontal part as like the control part and the back part is the sort of selfing system that can get in the way. And we all know that our self can get in the way of a task, um, basically. Um, I wanna pass the second question to Shenzhen because he's been pushing me to do that uh, multiple targeting for a while and uh, we've been trying to think about how to do that safely in the lab. Well there's not that much to say it's a great idea. Um, Sasha, Dr. Vestritsky referred to that when he talked about flexibility. That's one of the great things about ultrasound. Not only can we be very precise um, and go very deep, but we can control completely the spatial temporal um, arrangement of, of the whole thing and light up this and sort of, you know, turn the potentiometer a little bit down over here and do that in real time. So, 
there's nothing to say except what's not to love. I mean, this is really exciting in terms of possibilities. <laughs> but then, of course, there's the agony of parameter space. Maybe Jay could talk about that. Yeah, so, you know, trying to control things in the lab, ultrasound opens up uh, about seven trillion different possibilities of parameters, um, as I've, I've, I've tried to calculate on the back of a, a napkin. But there's also uh, the question of safety for us. Um, there's the basic safety of putting two beams of ultrasound into the brain can be very dangerous at once. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Um, also, we're, we're messing with very fundamental systems. We're modulating very fundamental systems in the brain. And we want to be very careful about that as well. That's partly why all of our work is enmeshed within mindfulness training. Uh, so we want to see the paradigm work by itself and then put this within you know, the context of doing something with those networks. Otherwise, uh, the brain is a highly nonlinear, dynamic, and complex system. And if you, if you sort of remove the control of too many systems at once, you could get some really negative situations in the brain. Uh, so we want to do that. Uh, we'll probably do it on Shenzhen first, uh, but we'll do it very cautiously. I can assure you, he tests me. <laughs> very, I, get, I have to do cognitive tasks, all sorts of stuff. We do all sorts of imaging to look for damage, whatever. All I can say is, uh, we can't say it's safe, but so far, so good. <laughs> we'll say it's safe in 20 years, hopefully. All right, all right. Um, let's do another question here. Um, this one is addressed to Dr. Bistritsky, but I think uh, the rest of the panel could comment after him. Um, so how does your focus ultrasound compare to transcranial direct current stimulation? Um, are the effects of ultrasound uh, similar, stronger, weaker? Um, and sort of another resounding comment or question from the, from the panel, or from the, the Q&A is uh, can this be used to enhance cognition in healthy individuals? Well, um, it, it's a different technique. Um, uh, transcranial direct current stimulation is a very superficial technique. It, you basically, you apply it uh, as electrodes in the brain. I did some research in this field and um, uh, here you're applying uh, the energy very deep and in much more focused way. Direct current stimulation, uh, as you could understand, you put it in the skin, it could spread through the nerves, through, through blood vessels, form uh, some magnetic, uh, low grade magnetic, electromagnetic field. So we, we don't really know what, you, what exactly you're hitting with that. It does seem to be changing um, uh, default network. We did the study where we placed people into functional MRI and did uh, trans uh, did direct current stimulation, and we did the the um, alpha steam uh, test device in the MRI. There is something happening in the brain, but it's very diffuse. So here you have an opportunity. Uh, really to influence specific area of the brain. And uh, specifically, I'm very interested in inhibitory effect because it's very strong. And you could basically isolate and temporarily reversibly turn off certain parts of the brain. So uh, in terms of safety, that presents a an interesting uh, uh, interesting paradigm. If, uh, if you just use ultrasound, ultrasound is very safe. I mean, people use Dopplers for years and years and years. People could spend uh, an hour using Doppler. Here, when you go to deeper structure, uh, and we using, actually, we never exceed uh, what we getting from Doppler, even so we we're about to publish studies from UCLA from epileptics where we actually took the tissue out. They would go for uh, surgery and we would analyze that tissue. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very safe technique in terms of destruction of the tissue. Uh, we literally, we also did the cadaver study and we literally uh, had to apply uh, 
uh, hundreds of times more energy to get to to see some damage in neuronal fresh neuronal uh, tissue and uh, so uh, it, that's not what we mean by safety uh, if it's uh, such an effective technique that could modify the brain so mostly uh, what's the long-term effect of that mostly uh, by modifying the effect, what are you doing exactly in the brain, especially when you're going to vital uh, emotional parts of the brain, and that remains to be um, investigated. That's why we basically advise people when they get the device, uh, just proceed with IDE application. A lot of times uh, uh, FDA looked at that and IRBs looked at that and gave no significant risk letters. Like for example, for OCD study, for coma study, um, uh, people received uh, uh, non-significant risk, meaning that you don't even have to file an ID. For epilepsy, it was different. You have to file. For TBI, you have to file sometimes. So it, it goes case by case, but I think it's all legitimate questions. And also, what parameters you use? Are you inhibiting? What are you? Uh, stimulating um, uh, uh, the issue of multiple stimulation, I think, can be solved by sequentially stimulating or inhibiting. You could have two transducers. If you activate them at the same time, you're going to get standing acoustic waves, and you're going to destroy brain. Don't do that. But but uh, if you do it in sequence and get a little time. Uh, then you're going to get interesting effects. So the future will show. That's our next move. Yeah. Well, be careful, guys. Get, <laughs> uh, get, your IRB, get your IRB involved, and if they ask for ID, please go to ID, uh, to FDA for ID, because it's. Uh, I think it's important not to. Uh, not to cause uh, problems in the field. Uh, like, for example, when Insitex started the first uh, trials of surgical instrument, they immediately went to uh, uh, glioma. And unfortunately, one of the patients almost immediately died right after the procedure, and, uh, exactly from the uh, standing waves because they did not know how to manage that. And that threw back. Uh, uh, the field by about seven years. So let, let's, uh, this this very exciting field, let's pre <laughs> proceed very carefully. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and just to be clear, uh, the studies that we are presenting today are IRB approved at the university. Okay. Yeah, we're doing those at the MRI facility. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> Everything should. And I, I would say that for people at home because we get, a, I get a lot of emails of people wanting to try this. Um, and I would say it, we're not at the phase where people could do this at home. It mm -hmm. needs to be done under proper supervision. We have a medical doctor on staff. You know, we are yeah. taking all the precautions. Yeah. Uh, don't do it at home. Uh, let's do it in the lab. Let's do research, fundamental research, before we start uh, going cavalier. This, we need brains. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next question. Uh, yeah, good cautionary uh, advice to the audience there. Um, so this is addressed to Dr. Sanguinetti and maybe Shinzen will have some comment on this, but um, have you done any research to show a persistent non-dual realization, AKA the induction of enlightenment, AKA persistent non-symbolic experience like Jeffrey Martin uh, proposes? Um, have you found evidence that enlightenment um, is real? Uh, all great questions, and uh, I will say that we are nowhere near uh, even understanding how to define those terms in the lab. Uh, we are still trying to define mindful awareness and trying to behaviorally measure that, uh, measure that with neuroimaging. Um, so I say, you know, it's part of the fun of being in the contemplative neurosciences is we're at the very beginning of asking what do those questions actually mean? What, what's the experience actually like for people? And uh, I don't discount those experiences. I believe that they are real, that people report them. But understanding how to quantify them and talk about them within the lab is, that's what Shenzhen and I in the lab do you know, pretty much all day. We're talking about these things. 
So it's, it's exciting and I suggest people get into it. Uh, but from the scientific perspective, we just can't say at this point. Shinzen, do you have a comment on that? Or? Well, um, I guess I would say two meanings to the word real. Uh, if by real you mean feasible, can the average person, if they set up a reasonable training structure, uh, hope within their lifetime to taste something like a persistent uh, non-symbolic awareness or awakening, liberated consciousness, you can use whatever terms you want. Is that real in the sense that if you do organized life practice, retreat practice, you get and give the right support, will you, do you have a shot at it as a normal householder? And I would say, hell yes, to that question. But the glory in science, as one of the Darwins said, not the Charles, uh, doesn't belong to the first person who says something that's new, true, and important. It belongs to the first person that proves it. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> it's all been said. <laughs> what Jay and I and others who are willing to work slow are interested in is what the hoops and barrels of science says is the test of quote real that's a very different test and we want the challenge of that test to prove in a sense that it's real they take some time i wanted to add to that that it's it's uh, extremely difficult and extremely important field. We're trying to objectivize subjective experience and, and uh, we need to proceed carefully uh, proving that we could do that, how we could do that. Only then we could make a judgment that this is what we really see and proving. All right, excellent answers. Um, so I think we have time for about one more question. We're at uh, three minutes left. Um, this question is uh, addressed to Dr. Sanguinetti. Uh, you may know the Muse EEG headset and their primary uh, application is this feedback to improve meditation. I believe it's uh, feedback of the alpha oscillation. Um, do you have a sense of the magnitude of your effect size um, to increase mindfulness uh, relative to that um, somewhat proven success story out there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it's actually a, a sort of a complicated question because I think Muse is being typically used by beginner people and they're getting a certain effect. Whereas most of the work we've done so far is we've started with very advanced meditators for the caveats that I said, we want to be careful about the psychological effect on people. Um, I've learned by working with advanced meditators that they're much more perturbable I think they're more sensitive to perturbations, uh, which makes sense. Uh, they're very sensitive. They're, their sort of physiological system is sensitive because they've been tuning it with attention practice. Um, so it's hard to say how those effects translate uh, to non-meditators. Um, but I can say that in the, uh, in the MRI study that I showed with the non-meditators, those effects were actually larger than we were expecting. The effect sizes, even on the network connectivity, were rather large. Um, so if that holds up, if, if we replicate that with the next study and we get a proper control and that holds up, uh, the effect size is going to be much larger, I think, than what you see with neurofeedback. Um, but I will say I like the Muse. I'm, one of, I'm good friends with the CEO, so I'm a little bit biased with their technology and I use it sometimes. I think it's great. All right. Um, well, I think this wraps up the Q&A. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, being able to chat with you all. Uh, wonderful presentations. Um, yeah, this uh, concludes the plenary session on enhancing consciousness with brain stimulation. I'm sure all of our panelists would uh, love to hear uh, from you all via email. Um, so let's keep the conversation going and uh, one more round of virtual applause for everyone who spoke here today.
And thank you for all your questions uh, in the audience. Enjoy the rest of your conference. And thank you, Justin. For thank you. Yeah, great job, folks. <laughs>